Namo tasa bhagavato alahato sama sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato alahato sama sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato alahato sama sambuddhasa Buddhang dhammang sanghang namasami So this is a talk just after the middle of the retreat. Six weeks have gone. Just uh, almost six weeks are left of this retreat. Time travels very fast. So I hope everyone's putting forth the effort in one's meditation uh, to be able to calm the mind down, to make it very peaceful, very, very strong, empower mindfulness, to see the truth, to see the Dhamma. When we say putting forth effort, I mean putting forth effort in the correct places, which is putting forth that effort into the knowing, into mindfulness, into being alert, and taking it away from doing, controlling, manipulating, which is where the effort should be focused. <coughs> and if we focus the effort on that, we find that our mindfulness becomes very, very bright. And with that brightness comes happiness, and with that happiness, nimittas arise. That's just the way of the mind. And sometimes that we need actually to understand exactly what's going on, to have insight into the whole process of the mind's relationships with its objects, in order to assist our development of not only calm and peace, but also the enlightenment which comes from that. As many of you know, when the Buddha taught the Dhamma in brief to Venerable Upali. He gave the same instructions to the first bhikkhuni, Mahapajapati, Gotami. He told him, told both of these, and I think it's mentioned elsewhere as well in the suttas, that whatever Dhamma, or so whatever things lead to Upasama, which lead to no peace, which also lead to Sambodhi, to enlightenment, so of these things you can know, the Dhamma and the Vinaya of the Buddha, the teachings and the discipline of the Buddha. He said a few other things there as well, but those are the ones I'm really talking about, which lead to, lead to Upasama and Abhinya and Sambodhi as well. Abhinya is like this deep insight knowledge. Abhinya, just really understanding what's going on. And this Upasama is the tranquility, the peace, the calmness. And you can see whatever leads to these things is called Dhamma and Vinaya. And it's the one thing leads to both. So whatever leads to insight also leads to calm. Whatever leads to calm leads to insight. And as one notices the, the blockages in the mind through insight, one, if it's really an understanding, if it really is an insight, those blockages disappear straight away. And in particular, I wanted to focus on today's talk upon not so much, not so much the objects of your mind when you're meditating, but just how you view those objects. What I call that the relationship between the knower and the known. Because you may have found in your own practice of meditation, and you may have uh, heard me say this, that sometimes you may have an object which doesn't seem to be all that conducive to still states of mind. It might be pain in the body, it might be a restless mind, it might be sounds outside of you which you take to be disturbing. And we have that restless mind, we have pain, we have sounds. That's called the known, the objects of consciousness. But we also have the knowing, the, the, that which knows not a person, not an ultimate reality, but just a process. But if we use that dichotomy of the knower and the known and look at the relationship between those two, then in that relationship we can not only gain a lot of insight but also gain a lot of peace as well because looking at that relationship is Dhamma, it's Vinaya. And sometimes it's not so much what you're experiencing it's not really so much the known, which is the problem, but it's how we look at it, our relationship to that object which causes the problems. It's happened several times in my meditation. That when I've been meditating, 
sometimes the mind is restless and I look at that restlessness and I don't take the restlessness by itself to be the problem rather I take the way I regard that restlessness to be the problem the relationship to that mental object <coughs> so what I do is I make that relationship to restlessness pure and wholesome and make it kusala and you know what kusala is, what wholesome is it's anything which is not following the path of the five hindrances so if I'm watching my restless mind and I've got craving, desire to sort of uh, keep it going and that's usually why restlessness continues is because there's something inside of us feeds that whole process the mind isn't by itself of the nature to be restless it's only when we feed it and keep it going there's a power source there there's a, a source of fuel which we sometimes can't see we haven't got the insight to see that you couldn't call that that fuel sort of interest, fascination wanting to be something it comes sometimes from fear whatever it is the source we get involved our relationship to the restless mind is what causes it to keep on going but if we watch that relationship rather than the object and just check those five hindrances is desire there if it is, cut it out don't worry about the object you're watching but how you watch it if there's ill will there I don't want to be restless why am I restless? I'm supposed to be a meditator I'm supposed to be an agent I shouldn't be doing this if there's an ill will there again the relationship to what you're experiencing is all wrong it can never turn into a wholesome object the restlessness can never stop that way there's sloth and torpor you're not looking at it clearly enough or the restlessness means you can't really focus on it you're just watching one object after the other or if there's doubt there you're not quite sure what to do it will never become quiet but if you take say, an object like restlessness and have the that which knows just look at it without interfering not wanting it to continue not wanting it to stop but just standing back detaching, letting go of it and being at peace with the restless mind having an armistice with the objects of your consciousness not trying to fix it, to force it because that is fault finding and more control but just leaving it alone letting go detaching meditating just for the sake of meditating not even wanting the restless mind to stop not even expecting something beyond that not even hoping that one day one will get beyond restlessness having no desire, cravings but just letting it be and if that relationship to the restless mind is pure in this way a relationship of peace of acceptance of loving kindness towards this mind you will find because the relationship is pure and wholesome that the restless mind will never be able to sustain itself very long if it's an unwholesome object it's feeding from something the object itself is almost like the result the weparka of what you were doing before you can't change that result, it's already here but what you can change is your where you relate to it so you don't make more unwholesome karma which creates the more unpleasant vipaka karma is the cause, vipaka is the result so if you've got that restless mind it's restless right now, that's the vipaka but right now I'm going to be looking at this with peace, with acceptance tranquility letting it be relinquishing, freeing and if you do that because when facing restlessness your mind is pure then you'll find that restlessness has to cease it has to fade out because you're not making any more mental karma you're turning off the fuel 
And it's fascinating when you do this. You get restless and you think your meditation's all over the place. You can never get in a meditation. In this meditation sitting, you just check the relationship you have with what you're experiencing. Make it pure. And you find the restlessness sometimes disappears in a, in a moment, in an instant. But at least it gets less and less and stops very, very quickly. Because you're not adding fuel to the fire of restlessness. Even to the point that that restlessness takes the form of some fantasy or some lust or whatever. Just check the way that you are looking at that lust. Check your relationship to that mental object. You'll find that lust or fantasies will continue simply because you want them to. Your relationship to that is great, marvellous. Keep going. I'm enjoying this. I want to see where this ends. You're feeding it. It's the relationship which is the thing to watch. The lustful thought which is there is come from the past because you've encouraged it. You can't do much about that with Parker, but you can do something with the way you're, expe you're relating to it. You can relate to it by not feeding it, by just standing back and just watching this. Standing back and watching it, you can actually experience, you can see, as the Buddha said, the gratification, the danger, and also the escape. Because you're relating to it, as it were, from a distance. You are regarding it in a wholesome way. You're investigating it, rather than indulging it. So when you have these things come up in the mind, just watch how you're watching them. Look at the relationship between that which knows and the known. And if you see that there's something unskillful there, that's what you can stop very easily. You can turn that around. And you can investigate. Very often anger and ill will is stopped that way. When we're angry at somebody or something, that we get so involved in the object of the anger, we can never even see this side of the anger, that which is experiencing this. But if you take that anger and create this beautiful duality of the known and the knower, and see just what connects the two, the relationship, how the knower regards the known, how that which knows regards anger. And you can see just there and then how you fuel that whole process called ill will. You get into it, you keep it going. But once you just stand back and just create a wholesome, a good, a pure, a Buddhist relationship to what you're experiencing, you just see the gratification, the danger, the escape, you see its impermanence, you see its ability to fade away. You let go, you detach, you make peace with anger. And when you make peace with anger, you're not trying to get rid of it, because that just adds fuel to the fire, that's adding oil to the fire. When you make peace with anger, you just watch. You find the anger just all disappears, very, very quickly. It can't keep going, because you're looking at what you're doing with this. And even if it's noises outside, as Ajahn Chah said, it's never the noises disturb you, it's you disturb the noises. The noises have already come. But very often the relationship we have to those is, I don't want this, it shouldn't be like this. It's fault finding, it's complaining. It's not the noise itself, it's how we look at it. So these are examples of actually how we gain insight into what's happening in our meditation and what happens in our life. We're getting insight into the way to become peaceful and also insight into the way to become enlightened because the two go together. Whatever's done in Vinaya leads to Upasama and Abhinya and Sambodhi. It leads to peace, it leads to insight, it leads to enlightenment. That's what the Buddha said. <laughs>